So shall we get started? Ready? Uh, so you can see my, my name is Justin Lykeb, and this talk is on high assurance programming, and we'll give some definitions for that. Uh, it's, it's very much a, a different talk than some of the other discussions that, that you might have seen at this conference. Um, it's, it's not directly JavaScript, but we are going to show a bunch of different things that compile to JavaScript, right? So, so we're all used to languages like CoffeeScript or, or ClojureScript that compile into JavaScript. So in, in that sense, everything that I'm doing is is, is very directly related to, to web development. And uh, I'll, I'll go into some of the motivations as well. Um, so essentially what we're, what we're going to cover, uh, first of all, I'm gonna start with the motivation of this talk. And even though this is a topic that is, is often discussed in academia, you'll hear that the, the motivations for why I'm interested in this are very much practical. We're gonna define high assurance and give a little bit of uh, philosophy about the, that we're dealing with. I'm gonna do some live coding, if the, the live coding gods uh, agree with me. Um, and, and that's gonna be a little bit of fun. We'll code a little bit of a video game in a programming language called Elm. And I'm going to go into something called dependent types. Who here has heard of dependent types? Good, that's, that's actually really good. So this is gonna be more of a survey of a space that I think uh, a lot of you might not have worked in. Um, and at least for myself, the, the thing that I really like about coming to conferences is seeing something that I haven't seen before. So being exposed to a totally different topical area. Um, and, and that's what I'm gonna be going into here, it sounds like, so that, that'll be really great. Um, and uh, in, in the end, we'll talk about uh, types and, and the future of the web. So that really goes into the, the motivation of this talk. Um, I assume a bunch of you heard the, the keynote, and they, they started talking about the, the motivation of, of forward JS, and the, the forward really indicates what, what the next uh, 10 or, or five, or at the rate that things change, even the next year of web development is gonna look like. And for me, I really hope that it follows the path that I'm going to lay out in this presentation. I don't know exactly what it's going to be, um, but this is something that is, is personally important to me, um, and, and I really hope that the web, uh, web development follows this path. So my background is in primarily web development. I've been working in the Ruby language for about nine years um, and doing a lot of uh, uh, backend application development, a little bit of JavaScript. And I gave a talk in, in 2009 um, I'm sorry, actually uh, 2012 at uh, GoRuco, the, the New York City Ruby conference. And it was called Sensible Testing. And I think that uh, most, most people here have done some kind of uh, unit testing, right? Uh, uh, behavior testing, unit testing. Um, and I gave a talk on, on best practices because certainly as, as we add unit tests, we gain a certain kind of confidence about our code, um, but we also add a certain kind of weight to the code base, right? The, the, the test code that we're adding is also code that we have to maintain. And, and change as we change the rest of our system. And so I was talking about things like the, the test pyramid, different, different patterns to make sure that the test gave us the confidence that we wanted um, without overly burdening the, the code base. Um, but in many ways, I wasn't satisfied with the talk. I, I really felt like I was, I was missing something. And at the point, uh, I, I didn't entirely know what it was, but it was clear to me that adding unit tests is one way of gaining confidence over a code base. Um, but what are we omitting by, by only talking about testing? Um, and, and, and this is essentially what, what led me into this. So what we're gonna be talking about is, is high assurance programming. And I think that high assurance programming is actually a rather uh, common sense notion. This is from the, uh, when, when Obama was talking about the nuclear accord with Iran uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he said that uh, the accord is built on verification, not on trust. So I think that before he was the president, Obama was doing some kind of high assurance programming. Um, that's, that's my uh, suspicion at least. I, I don't know that for a fact, so don't quote me, um, but it, it, essentially this is what a lot of high assurance programming boils down to, is, is not just trusting that our program works, but having different ways of, of verifying the program works. And so this may be testing, or this may be types, as, as we're going to, uh, to delve into in this talk. Uh, what I'm not gonna talk about is uh, software that we depend, that, that we put uh, uh, trust in for, for human lives. And there certainly is a whole area of high assurance software where they talk about that kind of thing. And as I said, my background is mostly in, in web programming, so we're gonna be talking about more uh, that side of, of high assurance programming. Um, 
And, and, that's, uh, and I think that this is something that we should all really be focused on. It's not just something for a couple of people in, in uh, making automatic braking systems for cars. Uh, it's, not, it's not their domain. It's really something that we should all be dealing with. And so we should go to a, a definition of, of high assurance. And there's a paper by Gallo, a company based in, in Portland, that I think does do a lot of government contracts and, and probably a lot of uh, systems that, that people um, put their, their trust uh, for, for lives in. And uh, they say that high assurance development means producing and compelling evidence that a system meets specified requirements. So going back to Obama's quote, um, uh, evidence is, is really the key notion. Um, and, and as we're continually evolving systems for web development, um, this, is, this is something that's really important to us too. So Agile says that we should always be able to adapt our systems to current needs and to, to future requirements uh, with a, a predictable amount of, of uh, anticipation. And so high assurance is, is really relevant to, to us in, in that area as well. So one way, as I've mentioned, that you can gain assurance that a system is working is through tests. And so tests are a form of dynamic analysis. And what we mean by dynamic analysis is that you have to run the program in order to get the feedback, right? So you're writing a test, and, and that's the input to the program, and you're going to get a specific output. And so that's dynamic analysis since you're running the program. Um, but I, I think that we want to go further than this. What we actually want is, is static analysis. So to me, something that is even more interesting is if we can get information from the program about whether its behavior will be correct before we even run it at, at compile time, essentially, right? Um, and, and so this is where types come into the picture. And if your experience in, in types is something like Java or C++, I think that the best way to understand the types that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation is to forget all of that. Um, and, and really, so we're, we're going to go into a, a very different uh, area of types. And this is actually one that has a, a long history um, that influences Java types as well, um, but this actually goes back to at least uh, 1910 uh, in the, the Principia Mathematica. So Alfred North Whitehead and his student uh, Bertrand Russell um, were trying to, to find a different uh, a foundation for mathematics that was more precisely defined than the currently used set theory. And so they started laying out in, in a, a very comprehensive um, uh, book, the, their notation and, and their idea for a type system. So this really goes way back, even before, you know, way before people started talking about Java or C or, or even COBOL. Um, and the modern types in, in type systems that I'm going to talk about have a lineage that, that goes back to that. And there's a paper called the, the Triumph of Types, if you want to get more information on this, uh, by Professor Robert Constable. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to see him present at um, uh, a conference, a set of sessions that I went to over the summer in, in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, called the Oregon Programming Language Summer School. And that was extremely eye-opening for me. It was, it was a couple of weeks of uh, very intensive programming language theory and mathematics. And they really went into these topics in, in much, much more detail. Um, but that paper is a good place to start to see how a lot of this really goes back to that point. So what are types, if, if that's what we're going to be focusing on? And what type systems are useful now, and what do we want in the future? So first of all, what are types? And there's uh, one of the things that you want to do if you're really getting into uh, type theory is there's a book uh, with a red cover called Types and Programming Languages by Benjamin Pierce. And for most graduate students in, in computer science, this is what they use to, to start studying programming language theory and type theory. Um, and Benjamin Pierce says that the, uh, the types are a method for proving the absence of certain program behaviors. And the word proving is really key here, because it, it really is a proof that beha those behaviors don't exist. So uh, a test is a good way of asserting that given a certain value, you get a certain output. But types are, are slightly different in their emphasis in that they can uh, verifiably show that a certain behavior doesn't exist. And, and that's a very important notion. Um, and the, you can also say that uh, static, type, uh, static type systems are the world's most successful application of formal methods. So this is a formal method for, for proving that your system is correct. I'm also going to gloss over this very briefly because I want to get to the live coding demonstration. Um, there's something called the, the Curry-Howard correspondence that, uh, how many people have heard of the, cor the Curry-Howard correspondence? Um, good. So, so some people in the audience have heard of this. Uh, there's a really good paper called uh, Propositions as Types, which is another name for the, the Curry-Howard 
correspondence, and it gives a much deeper logical implication for the notion of types. So essentially, we can say that uh, for each proposition in a logical system, there's a corresponding type. So essentially, what we're doing when we're writing programs is creating mathematical proofs. And when we're uh, simplifying a proof, um, it, it corresponds to evaluating a program. And this has really deep implications. If you ever, do me a favor, if you ever get bored about programming for a second and you say, you know, I think that I'm an expert in, in using JavaScript, using Ruby, um, start diving into this area because it, it's really mind expanding the way that um, the, the types that we're using in our activity really goes way beyond sending instructions to a computer. It really goes deeply into, into logic and, and philosophy and mathematics. Um, so if you're looking to open up a whole nother world that you can spend the rest of your life in, I would suggest going down this path. <laughs> Um, but really, the, the emphasis that, that I'm going to take in this talk is, is uh, very practical. It's not, a, not an academic one and not a theoretical one. Um, but in our company, and I, I founded a, a company, Stack Builders, that does um, consulting mostly in, in the Ruby programming language and in JavaScript. And we recently started going into Haskell. And we've been doing production projects in Haskell uh, for, for some clients. And, and this is really our experience. You know, Ruby is, is very popular, uh, and JavaScript too, I imagine, for doing things very, very quickly. So when, when Ruby on Rails became popular, there is a, a screencast of a, um, a demonstration of creating a blog in like five minutes or whatever, you know, a whole blogging system in five minutes. But what happens after that? You know, you, at some point, you reach this inflection point where you put in more and more effort and the returns aren't really as great anymore, right? And, and so we tried to change this inflection point by different methods, um, you know, following uh, advice from the clean coder, uh, arranging our, our code structure different, following the gang of for design patterns, um, structuring our test suite in a certain way. Um, but that, that inflection point still exists. And I, I'm not saying that type systems are a way to resolve this entirely, but I think that we should be spending more time talking about them. Because in, in Haskell, I found many cases where um, if, if a client would, would come to us, and many clients have come to us and said, hey, we've got this kind of budget, we've got this code base, and we want you to develop features X, Y, and Z. And we've said, well, no, there's, there's no way that we can um, confidently say that that will happen given the current code base since it doesn't have a test suite. We've had a different experience going into projects in Haskell where we don't have a test suite, we don't have continuous integration set up. Um, there are modules with many different responsibilities which people from an object-oriented perspective would say is not a good thing. And we're able to, to go into the code base and start being productive on the first day which is really impressive. Um, you know, something that with, with all these warning signs, we probably would have tossed a, a Ruby or a JavaScript code base. Um, but with a static type system, we can basically look at the types, determine more or less what the business domain is, and, and then start modifying the program in a productive way, just following the signs of the compiler. And if you saw the talk from Steve Klabnik, he, he alluded to a similar experience using Rust, which is in many ways uh, similar to, to Haskell. Um, so again, we're, we're not talking about life and death uh, situation software. We're talking about really concrete engineering benefits, and, and that's why I'm interested in this topic. Um, and it goes really into this uh, tweet that I saw a couple of days ago. This, this guy is saying that the fact that I can walk away from the middle of a massive refactoring to eat dinner with my wife shows that strong typing improves lives. You know, <laughs> Some of the toughest stuff that I've done in Ruby is where you get you know, a mile deep into a refactoring, and usually when you know, I've been refactoring for a couple hours, I'm, I've been doing Ruby for nine years, and I'm still only about 25% confident that I'm going to just not do a Git checkout and blow away the whole thing, you know, and, and start again down, down a different path. Um, but, but Haskell gives us this, this really quick feedback, even without types, um, even without tests, about uh, what, the, uh, what we should do to satisfy the compiler. I, I hope that the, the part that you're able to get out of the presentation is that, you know, doing statically typed functional programming is, is not something that's scary. We were able to, to do something that was very productive in, in a very short amount of time. Um, and, and so this goes into the, the increasing type system expressiveness that I, that I wanted to get to in this in this presentation. Um, as I said before, if, if you've been using something like Java or C++, um, we really want to forget everything that those type systems give us. Because um, for, for a very specific reason, I'm not just bashing on them because I, I don't like them or anything. They're, they're fine. Um, but they're, they're limited in a couple of senses. The, the type system is not very expressive. So we have scalar types. We have integers. We have strings. We have doubles. Um, but they're, they're not very expressive. They don't have things like algebraic data types, so like the Mario uh, uh, structure that we started 
started using in, in the last example are, are absent from things like Java. Um, and they also are, are not very cheap to use because you have to annotate them all over the place. You've got to say this function ret returns a string, this function returns an int. Um, whereas in things like Elm and in Haskell, you have type inference, so you get that for free. Uh, and I, I believe in Rust as well, as, as Steve was uh, demonstrating this morning. But we can even do better. And languages like Haskell have something called kinds. Um, and uh, they're, they're also dependent types. So I'm going to go through these very, very quickly so that there's time for a couple of questions at the end. Um, I already talked about scalar types. Those are the, the ones that aren't as interesting for me. Um, because really, what you want to do is code as much of your domain into the, the type system as possible so that there's less of a chance that it'll go wrong at, at runtime. Um, so algebraic data types, like the type that we use for Mario, is more interesting. And uh, there, there's something. Uh, neat that I, I saw about Rust. In, in Rust, I guess they have uh, about the same concept using an enum, but algebraic data types are kind of mathy, so when people heard, oh, Haskell's got algebraic data types, they're like, what the heck do I use those for? And then they called them enums in Rust, and everybody's like, oh yeah, of course, we use those all over the place. right? <laughs> so we can just kind of call them enums or something as well. Um, those are very useful. And they could be thought of as sum types, which combine together a bunch of different types, or a kind of a record type. Um, they can also be used recursively, so you can have a type that refers to itself to make like a linked list or a binary tree, something like that. Um, and they can usually be analyzed using pattern matching, which allows us to pluck apart these types um, without using conditional logic. And, and that's something that I think once you start using in uh, a language like Haskell, it'll be really tough to go back to a language that doesn't have pattern matching. So here's a quick example. As I was mentioning, you can have uh, types that are, that are self-referential, as this uh, tree structure is, where it refers to itself here. Um, that's a good example of an algebraic data type. This is also very interesting. Uh, in, in Haskell, you have a, a type of types. So once you start having types, you want sometimes a way to reason about types or a way to construct types. And so an integer is, is what we call a concrete type. That's a type in itself. But then you've also got this maybe. So the maybe in, in Haskell and in languages like Scala, uh, Scala which is like Swift, I think. Um, what, what they'll let you do is that they, they want you to avoid null, null pointer exceptions, which uh, I believe Anthony Horace said was the, uh, he called his billion dollar mistake. Um, you know, this results in lots and lots of bugs in computer programming. So ideally, we want a, a way to get away from those. And, and Rust has that, Haskell has this. Um, but once you have something like this, you want to be able to use it with a bunch of different types. So you want to have something that maybe contains a Boolean or maybe contains a string. So essentially what this is, it's like a function at the type level that accepts another type to be a concrete type, okay? Um, and, and that's a really useful thing because it gives us a different abstraction to, to talk about and to use the type system. So dependent types are even a, a step further than this. And you could refer to these as a, a type um, that depends on a term that might not be known until runtime. So the, the overused example of something like this is um, something like a, a list that uh, requires a certain length, right? And, and so that's really useful because in many languages, you can have a list and then you run off the end of it or you try to pick an element from the front of it, but it's empty. Um, in, in languages with dependent types, you can actually specify in the type system that a, le a list must be of a certain length. Um, so that eliminates another class of errors. And so what this brings to mind with dependent types is that um, the, uh, the program can be correct by construction. And, and this is something else that comes from uh, Benjamin Pierce's uh, types and programming languages. So when I was doing this presentation or a similar presentation in uh, Chicago for, for Lambda Jam, uh, someone asked, well, you know, this, this does really well if you know what the program is supposed to do, but what if you're wrong about the specifications, right? Um, and, and that's a very good point because obviously if you don't have a good idea about your specifications or if your assumptions are wrong about the specifications, then it's much tougher to make a correct program. It's, it's probably impossible, right? Um, so what does this allow us to do? Well, if we have dependent types and if we have extremely expressive types, we're much closer to actually just encoding the specifications right in the type itself, right? And, and theoretically, there's, there's almost no limit to this. Um, however, this is a double-edged sword. Um, and as you, as you get more and more expressive types along the lines of dependent types, the system becomes a little bit different, uh, difficult to use. Uh, and, and specifically, you lose some properties of type inference. Um, but this is a really interesting experiment in, in languages like Idris, which is new. Um, I think that might have a JavaScript backend, um, and Agda, and uh, Coq as well. Um, but also in, in languages like Haskell that, that we found to be really pra uh, practical. And Haskell, of course, uh, just uh, mentioning this since this is a JavaScript-y crowd, a lot of this stuff you can compile right to JavaScript. So Haskell has a, a, a compiler called GHCJS, which can emit JavaScript code that you can run right in the browser.
Um, so Haskell is, while there are other languages that are coming out with dependent types, Haskell is also moving in the direction of getting more expressive types itself. And I don't have time to go into these too much, but there is something called Liquid Haskell, um, which is a, a project from uh, Ranji Jala, and it's a, a really interesting way to, to get dependent types uh, that are dependent on terms inside of uh, a Haskell program. And also uh, Stephanie Weirich's uh, academic work that makes the, the types in Haskell more expressive. Um, but really, to, to reiterate the point that I, I made a while ago, this is really a practical concern. You know, this is, uh, not, all, not all of us write software that people's lives depend on, but all of us write software that our weekends depend on, right? That our, our families depend on, that our managers and, and product owners depend on. And, and so this is really a, an extremely important engineering concern. And as I, I mentioned earlier, we've had experiences where programs that we would have thrown out in a language like Ruby, we were able to preserve and, and extend and use in, in something like Haskell. Um, and, and the goal is finding a sweet spot in, in this whole spectrum of, of expressivity of types. You need to find a sweet spot where you've got a practical language that gives you expressive enough types to encode as much of the domain as you can without really dragging you down in, in using these types. And for us, right now, Haskell is, is really fitting that bill very well. Um, there's, there's a whole other language. Uh, there's something called Urweb, which is actually a dependently typed language. Um, and it emits uh, JavaScript code as well as uh, uh, other compiled code for the server side. So that that's an interesting way of expressing more of your domain in, in a dependent type. And interestingly, ER uses types to ensure, to provably ensure that things like SQL injection attacks don't occur. And so there's a lot of really cool properties that come out of this when you start pushing the, the boundaries of, of type systems. Um, and I think that in, in the coming years, this is another thing that's, that's really going to, uh, uh, to become very important in, in web software development. Um, there, there are some production sites as well in Ur. Um, and you can go even further and, and use systems like Coq, which was one of the original uh, implementations of uh, dependent types. There are actually earlier ones too, like uh, New Perl and, and uh, uh, other dependently typed systems. But this is a, a very interesting system in itself um, that also helps you to create mathematical proofs. Um, so what are, what are we uh, going for here, really? The, the point that I want to make is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the notion of type systems isn't even something that's constrained to computers. It's something that comes from trying to create a more solid foundation for mathematics. It just so happens to be useful for doing computer programming in, in a small subsection of, of that world. Um, so I'm not saying that types are a silver bullet. Um, they're certainly not. And as many people have said over the years, that doesn't exist in programming. And if we look for that, we're probably foolish. But it is something that, that comes to us rather cheaply and that we have the, the tools to use right now for practical web development. Um, and it, it's not a free lunch. Economists will tell us that there is no such thing as a free launch. Actually, it's one that we've been paying for since 1910 in, in really rigorous thinking about the, the structure of ways that we can classify mathematical systems. And we're able to reap the benefits of that today in creating more robust and more maintainable web software systems. So the next time that we go to a, a conference and all they talk about is the way to structure test suites, um, you know, that's, that's very much where I was several years ago before getting more of a theoretical and practical background in, in good statically typed systems. Um, I, I really hope that we, we start bringing up the points of, of how type systems are practical and how they can help our everyday engineering needs. And I hope that this is the way that, uh, that web engineering goes in the future, uh, regardless of exactly where it falls on the, the type spectrum. These are some, uh, some references that are too small to see, but I, I will uh, put these online. Uh, the, the conference will be putting these online shortly. So that's, that's all that I have for the, the presentation. And we have some, I'm looking forward to hearing what questions you have. <laughs> So I, I left a, a few minutes. We have four minutes for questions. Um, so what, yes? Uh, what are your thoughts on TypeScript? Uh, so the question is, uh, what are my, my thoughts on TypeScript? And unfortunately, I haven't used TypeScript myself. Um, I, I feel like, uh, from, from what I've heard about it, it, it seems like the, the types are not as expressive as a system like Haskell. Um, and so I, I'd have to go and check. I mean, I, I didn't. Uh, uh, from what I heard about it, it, it didn't seem like it had things like uh, uh, algebraic data types. Um, I don't know how the type inference is, that kind of thing. I, I guess that's how I would evaluate it if I went to look deeply at, at TypeScript. Um, as, as I've been saying, the, the main benefits for me are where you start getting types that you can really encode a lot of your domain in. So if all you have are scalar types, um, that's a major disadvantage right there from an, a practical engineering perspective, I think. And then if it doesn't do great type inference, you've got to annotate everything all the time, then that's also 
that means that the benefits that you're getting, minimal as they may be, uh, don't come as cheaply as they should if you've got a good type inference engine. Of course, you know, systems like C Sharp are, even though they don't have extremely expressive types, they're, they're getting better at uh, type inference. So the, the cost is, is going down in, in languages like that. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the question, the, the question was, is there a, a notion of unit testing in Haskell? And um, Haskell's types, as I was uh, mentioning, they're, they're not the be-all and end-all in, in type systems. There, there are systems with fully dependent types that are much more expressive than Haskell's. Um, so in, in Haskell, what we find is that we write maybe a quarter of the tests or so um, in Haskell that we would in a language like Ruby or, or JavaScript. We, we find that uh, you know, there, there's a huge engineering benefit, and we probably write about 75% you know, less tests in Haskell than we would in other languages. But certainly, there, there is uh, property-based testing in a library called QuickCheck, which is very popular, as well as uh, unit testing and, and behavior testing that are, are really essential. Um, for, for quickly testing things, I think, in, in some ways, and also for filling in the gaps where you don't have types that are ex as expressive as you'd want. <laughs> um, yes? How do you apply this to a, a code project in, in another language? Yeah, without fully importing it to Sure. I mean, yeah, that's that's a really good question. How do you how do you apply this to so if you've got an existing project that's in that's in JavaScript or something, um, can you start applying these ideas? I, I think that um, there there are still areas that are being worked on um, in order to do this. I think that languages like Elm, uh, things like GHCJS that compiles to JavaScript, um, I think that those are giving us avenues to do some programming in, in these languages and then interoperate through a foreign function interface to to things like JavaScript. And so I would look for things like that. Um, I guess that uh, the, the other things that I would look for are just ways that you can think of the, the types of your functions. Because just because you're working in a dynamically typed language um, doesn't mean that you don't have types. Uh, a lot of times, you really just have a lot of implicit types. And, and so if you start programming and exper experimenting in a language like Haskell, um, I found that it really changed the way that I thought about programming. And really, that's what you want. You know, Some people will say, well, learn a different language every year. You know, I, I never ended up hitting that mark myself. Um, what, what I do try to do, though, is that at least every couple of years, I try learning a language that really changes the way that I think about programming. So I'd say don't go from Ruby to Python and expect huge benefits. Don't go from Ruby to, to JavaScript. But do go from like Ruby to, to Prolog or, or Ruby or JavaScript to Prolog or JavaScript to Haskell. And what I found is that when I go back and work in Ruby now, I, I more clearly see the, the types in my mind that were implicit before. And, and so that's another way. Even if you're not going to make the jump for your whole program or part of the program, I, I think that there's a cognitive switch that occurs um, when, when you're using, when you start experiencing a, a language like Haskell that, that changes the way that you think. And for, for me, I, I feel like I'm a, a better programmer because of it. Maybe my colleagues would, uh, would disagree. <laughs> Um, so we, we are uh, out of time. I'm, I'm supposed to wrap up at 2.30, uh, but, but thank you very much, and I'll be around if anybody has questions. Thank you.